Well, thanks very much. And uh, great to be here to, uh, to talk about the technology. I seem to spend a lot more time in Silicon Valley talking about this to people. And it's great to be here in London um, talking about our technology as well as being developed here actually in Bristol. So let me tell you a little bit about GraphCore and what we're doing. Um, we are developing a new kind of hardware that lets innovators create the next generation of machine intelligence. You know, over the last few years, machine intelligence, uh, AI as we sometimes call it, has really made huge steps. Um, people have been using existing CPU processors. Um, they've been using graphics processing units to get more um, arithmetic compute um, to move this uh, whole agenda forward. But what's really needed here is a completely new type of processor, a completely new type of hardware to support what is a fundamentally different workload. And, and just to try and illustrate that a little bit, this um, image that you can see here, this actually comes from our uh, software environment. It captures the output from these high-level uh, machine learning frameworks like TensorFlow. It converts that into a computational graph. And it's this that we map to our very highly parallel um, processor. It looks very organic. Um, and that's really just a, a function of the visualization here, where what we're trying to do is to show what is closely linked together from an interconnect point of view. And the tiny little dots, um, they are the, uh, the compute functions, the transfer functions that are happening uh, within each of the small software tasks that are running on these uh, many processors. Not one process is running many tasks, um, which is how we're able to cope with this, this hugely complex uh, compute tasks. So what do we really mean by machine intelligence and really what's different here? And what I would challenge to say is that we're moving into a completely new era of compute. For the last 70 years, we've told computers what to do step by step in a program. Um, so we've instructed them with an algorithm. We've worked out what the parameters are that are important. We've taken lots of software engineers and we've written very complex code to be able to convert that into an algorithm that will tell us, you know, is, is the output we're looking for represented from this set of uh, inputs. And what we're moving to is a world in which instead, if we can find enough data, and we can find some data that's labeled, or we can come up with techniques that allow us to train even from um, unlabeled data, we can actually build models, and we can learn what the parameters are, and we can learn um, how those parameters work together to create the kind of outputs we're looking for. And ultimately, the results can be much, much better, much more accurate. So today, Whereas a few years ago, we had algorithms that would try and identify um, facial recognition. And if you've been through the border controls at um, Heathrow Airport, you'll know that they don't work very well. But now we have systems that have been trained using machine intelligence um, that can recognize human faces actually better than a human can. We can recognize words better than a human can. We're still struggling with sentences. We're still struggling with the complexity of language um, because language is very complex. We need, we need context. We need to understand the context of the conversation, which means we need feedback. Um, feedback effectively is memory. We need to understand you know, what, what I'm talking about, how that relates to the next words in the sentences. So, so there's still a lot of work um, to do. Video is very challenging. Um, but again, we're working on this, and there is the next generation of machine intelligence that will allow us to solve these problems. And that's really the opportunity here, moving from this world of programmed algorithmic to learning systems, machine intelligence systems. And these are the important problems that we need to solve going forward. A drug discovery, you know, we had a, a talk earlier about how we need to get um, the drugs delivered to the disease. Um, understanding that and working out how to do that is very important. Uh, understanding which drugs are going to be um, useful in solving various difficult uh, diseases. Um, translating languages, um, talking um, and conversing with humans. Um, you know, these are all interesting things. You know, predicting trades. Um, you know, understanding video. This becomes very important. You know, you think about social media. 
you know, a few years ago, everything on social media was kind of typed or maybe a few pictures. Now it's all videos. For the social media companies to understand what you're doing on your social media um, site, they need to understand the videos that you're uploading. Uh, otherwise, they don't really even have a business and they can't serve you and make these services uh, useful. Driving a car. Driving a car is fundamentally an intelligence task. And what we really mean by intelligence, you know, people say you can't really define it. Well, we try. And what we say is intelligence is the capacity for rational decision making, which is informed by imperfect knowledge. We don't know everything. We try and make useful decisions based on the knowledge that we have available. And, and we, sometimes we're going to get it wrong. And so we learn from experience. Um, and it's this ability to learn and to improve, which is really fundamental to these next generation machine intelligence systems, systems that will understand new sets of data and feed that in so that the systems can continue to get better um, going forward. So how is this all possible? Well, what's happened is that we have access to just huge amounts of data. The, the internet has created huge repositories of data, more and more data, more and more labels, and in many cases that data is understood. It's, it's labeled up so that we can actually use it to train these systems. Algorithms have actually existed for the last 20 or 30 years. The, the ideas, the model structures, um, people have had ideas about this for 20 or 30 years, but it's really the availability of data and huge amounts of compute in first uh, cloud data centers um, and now with new hardware that is allowing these systems to actually work and to actually learn and to produce accurate results. As we get more parameters and more compute, we can generate systems with higher and higher levels of accuracy. And the next step is to be able to create systems that understand context and can learn and can get better um, as we go forward. So this new workload from machine intelligence is something completely new. And I apologize if I get into some of the, uh, the technicalities here. But you're talking about structures that have many parameters, many compute tasks, um, that are operating on these uh, separate parameters. And that creates massive parallelism in the problem. And that's very important, because to be able to build highly parallel processes, we need much more parallelism in the problem so that we can oversubscribe these parallel tasks to the processes. We can efficiently use all of the processes all of the time and make very efficient systems. There's something we call sparsity in the data structures. Not all the parameters relate to other parameters um, in the models, but there is high levels of connectivity. It's not just defining a space in three dimensions. We typically want to know, you know, use, extending that idea of where in time it is, what, what, what uh, liquid or gas we're in, or many other parameters to describe some parameter that, that we're interested in. So these are very high dimensional problems and as I map those into a memory system, I can't put all of the data together. The data becomes spread out in the memory system. It's what we call sparse data. And so we need processes that can gather the data, do the compute, write the data back um, to where it needs to be in the memory structures in the processes. In computers today, in algorithmic work, people focus a lot on very high precision compute. They're looking for very precise answers. Whereas in machine learning, we're actually dealing with systems which create precise answers, but they do that from an ensemble of very imprecise uh, calculations. So the precision of the compute is much lower than we're used to. This is a world in which we don't need these very high precise um, compute nodes we need lower precision compute nodes. We just need many, many more of them. So it's a different type of arithmetic. And there are lots of complications in the arithmetic that we need. Putting all of this together in software is very difficult. But we work on the basis that these graphs that we're creating are basically static. They don't change. The neurons in your brain don't change. The connections between them don't change. You just populate as you learn um, new elements and new um, understandings. And that's the same in these computers. And that works well for us because it means the complexity of how we map these software tasks to the hardware 
we can do that in compilers. The compilers are incredibly complicated. It's a huge part of the project um, that we've been working on in GraphCore, but we can actually solve those problems in the compiler. And the last piece I would say is something that's even more esoteric. Many of these problems are very noisy. Um, and sometimes the right thing to do is to inject noise um, into the problem, something called entropy. Um, you know, to try and give you an example, let's say you're crossing the road and you're halfway across and a car's coming towards you, you could equally go to the left or you could go to the right. There's no right answer there. Sometimes if you inject a little bit of noise, you'll force yourself to go to the left and you'll make a very quick decision. Um, you know, it's a very trivial example, but this idea that noise is very important as part of these machine learning systems, you need to have the hardware that can support that. And all of these things are not supported by today's CPUs or today's GPUs. The other thing which is really important, it's not too difficult to put down hundreds or thousands of separate processors onto a silicon die, to build that all and integrate that all together into one chip. But the real challenge is how do you get those separate processors to talk together? How do you get them to share data? How do you get them to cooperate on these complex problems? Many, many years ago in the 1960s, there was a research scientist at IBM Research, and he started to look at, at circuits. And he did these random um, experiments to look at how many interconnects, how many inputs versus how much uh, logic was inside different pieces of the circuits. And what he found was there's actually this power law relationship between the amount of logic you have and the number of inputs, something we call now Rentian scaling. Rents was the guy who did these experiments. And interestingly, the same as that exists in circuit design and in, in, in semiconductor design, the same exists in the brain. If you take a segment of a brain and you look at how many neurons there are, the number of axons or synapses that connect those neurons together grows on a power law as you put more and more neurons down. And the same is going to be true about these new types of processors for machine learning. As we put more processors down onto the chip, the real problem to solve is how do we connect these processes together? What is the interconnect structure that we use? How do we get these processes to cooperate um, together? And if you look at the IP that GraphCore is developing, these are the fundamental issues that we're solving and building into our solution, both at the software level and at the hardware level uh, as well. So what that leads to is a very different kind of processor. The CPUs we use today in our laptops and in the servers in the cloud, they don't really solve the problem for us. GPUs are being used today for machine learning to get us going. Um, they're very useful to do some, some strong mathematics, which is helpful for some of these problems, but they really don't provide the, the solution going forward. What we need is a new type of processor, something we call an intelligence processing unit, an IPU, and it's based on this idea of a graph where we have all of these neurons connected um, in a very complex way and that we can efficiently process these new types of machine learning problems. We have a software environment that supports that. Again, we're getting into a lot of technology, but the key thing here is we've made it seamless for developers. Developers today are using things like Google's TensorFlow environment to describe their machine learning problems, or MXNet, or Cafe2, or PyTorch. So the outputs of those we take directly, we convert them to these large graphs, we map them um, to these very complex processes, and along the way we produce those wonderful images that you get to, uh, to have as well, to see what's actually going on. All of this results in a solution that for the same power, for the same size, on today's problems that people are solving today with GPUs, we go about 10 times faster, which is great. But what's really important and what the innovators are finding so exciting about this new technology is for the, for the future workloads, those workloads that have recurrent structures, the problems that need memory structures like LSTM and, and new innovations in machine learning. As we look at benchmarks for those applications, we're 100 times better than the GPUs, sometimes 200 times better uh, than the GPUs on those new workloads. And what that really opens up is the ability for people to create 
the next type of problem, solve the next problems, have solutions that can deal with context and become much more intelligent. So this is the new hardware to solve for this intelligence processing problem. So that's why we say our IPUs allow innovators to create the next generation of machine intelligence systems. And as Siraj said, we walk on the shoulders of giants. You know, Alan Turing 70 years ago said we need computers that can learn from experience. And here we are finally in the UK as well, developing this next generation of technology that can solve these problems for machine intelligence. Thank you very much.